Hey guys, Snarky Guy here, and tonight we're gonna go for a little ride throughout Shanghai just after the typhoon. Yeah, for those of you who don't know what a typhoon is, it's pretty much the same as a hurricane. Google it. You'll feel much smarter. Of course, when I compare a massive typhoon in Shanghai with its counterpart in Hong Kong or even the recent hurricane in Louisiana, yeah, we pretty much got a lot of rain and some wind. Bikes get knocked over. Some ladies had a wardrobe malfunction thanks to untimely wind gust. It happens. Welcome to Shanghai. Now some of you are probably thinking, hey, is that safe? Driving around late at night on wet city Shanghai roads on a made in China electric scooter made and serviced by the cheapest bidding contractor? And I'd have to say the answer is, yeah. And first of all, made in China isn't what it used to be. And consider that China is the world's Willy Wonka and, well, everything gets made here. So, yeah, it's got to pass your international standards. Gone are the days of electronics that die slightly faster than your ego when you catch a reflection of yourself in the mirror in those skinny jeans. Seriously, you just don't. Also, there's a lot more dangerous things to do here in Shanghai, like getting T-scammed, for example. Hey, want to get T-scammed? Visit a shoddy underbelly of a tea house slightly more fake than a $3 bill and get fiscally and possibly mentally raped over the coals of a make-believe 2,000-year-old tea ceremony that'll leave you slightly more destitute than Bill Gates' ex-wife had they signed a prenup? Sign me up. Now, who wants to get tea scams? Well, you do, naturally. Follow the worst-kept secret of a scam on your personal journey into the depths of the Shanghai underworld as she introduces you to a completely flim-flam tea ceremony. They'll have you dressed up like a llama and speaking like a pedantic four-year-old wanting to listen to just a little more BTS, at which point several large-looking beefcakes will make you, in fact, their personal bitch if you don't pay handsomely for the privilege of drinking weak-ass centauri out of a cup of questionable hygiene. But hey, it's an experience, right? Now as I'm riding along, you might hear a little hum in the background. Part of that is because, well, that's the sound tires make on wet Shanghai roads as you're tolling along at about eh, 35 kilometers an hour. But also, it's because one of the brake calipers on my scooter was completely dead. Yeah, I know, makes it all the more exciting riding around post-typhoon weather on a scooter with only one working brake caliper. It makes it quite terrifying and exciting all at the same time. Now, later on this evening, I was fortunate enough to find a 24-hour scooter repairman. He completely fixed my brakes, took apart the caliper, the brake uh, reservoir lines, did the whole thing in the middle of the night and only charged me 50 RMB. Yeah, we're talking about uh, just under eight bucks US for 24-hour service in the middle of the night. Tell me where else in the world you're gonna find that. But wait, let me answer for you. Nowhere, that's where. Speaking of vehicles that need repair, this kind of takes me back to when I was in university. I had just moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I was in need of a car. Unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of money to spend on a car, as most university students simply are flat broke. So I started looking at the newspaper. Yes, the newspaper, back then the internet was a thing, but a lot of cars are still prominently featured in newspapers. And I found a Camaro for sale. Now, for those of you who don't know, a Camaro is kind of a little bit of American legend. It was a sports car-esque, if you will. They didn't really perform much like a sports car, but they looked cool and so we loved them. And much to my surprise, I found a Camaro for sale for 300 US dollars. So I called and a farmer had this paper about 50 miles away. And when I called about the Camaro, he says, yeah, I got a Camaro, I'll sell you. A Camaro? Do you mean Camaro? And yes, definitely interested. So I had a buddy give me a lift all the way out there. And I got there and I found, sure enough, the guy did actually have a Camaro. It was a 1984 baseline Camaro that was beat to hell. 
And when I say beat to hell, I'm not exaggerating. This car was in a barn, stripped down, and there were goats living in the back of the car. Yes, goats. <laughs> to this day, there's nothing quite like that new goat smell in a car, you know? And the guy wanted $300. I want $300, but I keep the goats. And you know what? That's fair enough. I was a single guy living in an apartment. I probably couldn't have goats anyway. So I paid the guy and took the car home. Now, this was possibly the worst death trap I could have owned at this time. This car leaked every fluid except gas. I exaggerate not. Of the four brake calipers on the car, one of them worked, which means stopping was a bit of a challenge. You had to kind of plan these things out. As far as the car leaking fluids, well, that was one of those things that was somewhat mitigated through a lot of uh, jerry-rigging duct tape and, of course, buying oil every single week for this car. Every week, once a week, I had to go down to the convenience store and I had to buy a quart of oil. I usually bought some Coke at the same time, and I would put one of those in the car, that being the oil. It got to the point where I got so tired of putting oil in this car, which wasn't terribly expensive for a quart of oil, but it wasn't cheap either, that I started thinking, you know, I wonder what would happen if I started putting Coca-Cola into the engine instead of the oil. Over time, this uh, question started to become a sincere curiosity, because it was a terrible car. But what's the worst that could happen? It explodes on the spot, you walk away, you got a great story, right? So I did. One day I decided, why not? So I poured the Coke right in the top of the engine, right in the crankcase, and much to my surprise, nothing bad happened. In fact, the car, if anything, seemed to run better. Now, I've since talked to some mechanic friends of mine, and they tell me what happens. Basically, the sugar gets in the engine, it seals up a lot of your vacuum leaks, temporarily, of course, um, and makes things a little better, if you will. Now, what I started doing after time is I started buying some oil and two Cokes. One for me and one for my homie. That seemed to work for the time being, but again, it was a terrible car. Uh, it was wanting any opportunity to kill me. I knew it, and so I decided to sell the car. After owning the car for approximately three months, I put another ad in the paper, and I decided, you know what? Let's just give myself a little wiggle room, as it will, and try to negotiate. I bought the car for $300 and I advertised it for $600. Now the day the paper came out, much to my surprise, I got a knock at my door and there were three large hillbillies outside my door asking about the car. Do I want to sell it? Do I still have it? Of course I do. How much do you want? $600, I told them. And much to my surprise, again, they forked over $600 crisp, clean Benjamins, $100 bills, without even trying the car, without test driving it or anything else, just paying the money. As for the title, I had the presence of mind to get a bill of sale at the time, and they left. Very strange, I thought, but you know what? One really looks a gift worse in the mouth, so I was quite happy I got uh, $600, double my money, and I no longer had a death trap. We call that a win. Um, and about a month went by without much thinking about it at all. About a month later, I got another knock on my door. This time, it was the Tulsa police. They wanted to know if I had a 1984 Camaro license, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, I sold blah, blah, blah license plate Camaro about a month ago. They asked me if I had a uh, bill of sale. I assured them I did. I showed them the bill of sale. And at this point, they produced a search warrant and they wanted to look over my apartment. Well, now, again, I, I can kind of see the writing on the wall here, but there's not much I can do. Am I under arrest? I asked them, no, no, you're not. But you might want to have a seat down on the couch. No problem, officer. I sat down and they went to my apartment, which didn't take long. I didn't have a lot of furniture back then. You know, of course, they checked the sofa, you know, the you know, computer area, the bed, and even looked inside my refrigerator. Again, asked me about the same car, 1984 Camaro, license, blah, blah, blah. I showed him my bill of sale. I told him details about how I bought the car, how I sold the car, and everything I knew at that point. 
At which point, one of the officers was kind enough to give me some backstory, a little nuance, if you were. And they told me that the car was, in fact, pulled over. Uh, some very large men had it. And they were pulled over by a canine unit. Now, a canine unit is a regular uh, officer who happens to have a dog with him, a sniffer drugs sort of thing. And the dog alerted the officer. They started searching the car, and they found a lot of hash. That would be the Mary Jane. That would be uh, you know, the, 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 the wacky tobacco. You know what I'm talking about, a little 420, under the dash of the car. Now, I had no idea it was there the whole time, and I often wonder what would happen if I had gotten pulled over and I had been caught with this uh, stuff, you know? No officer is not my dope, but would they have believed me? I don't know. Uh, now, I never got to, fin to finish the story as far as my own, uh, you know, what happened. But I always suspected what happened was, I knew that the uh, guy who sold me the car, it was originally his son's, and he'd taken the car away from his son. I kind of suspect this guy was storing his drugs in the car and sold the car out from under his son, not knowing what was inside, and they were always looking for it. As it turns out, they uh, someone found the car, they bought it sight unseen, and got caught with the substance in hand, and naturally pointed their finger back at Jimmy, back at me, saying, yes, we bought it from that guy. Um, now, what's a guy to do? At the end of the day, um, I did double my money on the car. I ended up having a car for a couple of months, and I got a better car with the money. So, it is a win, but like anything else, the follow-up to that is yet another adventure. Well, hey, I appreciate you guys joining me for a little uh, post-typhoon, late-night, soggy Shanghai riding adventure, complete with a few snarky stories for good measure. And like anything else, make sure to like, comment, and that's not your typical late-night riding attire, is it? Interesting. And just like that, we've reached the end of the video, which means you now have the opportunity to smash, wham, slam, and wallop that subscribe button. Thus, never again missing another Snarky Eye video. And not too hard now, a keyboard is a terrible thing to waste. Click the bell icon to get notified, of course. In the meantime, here's a few more Snarky Eye videos because... I know you're gonna dig this.